On today's World Insight with Tianwei, China's first international import expo in the world. How will new trade platforms and ideas provide new momentum? And in tonight's Writing China, hang on to the words of master Chinese poet Si Chuan. Why is his approach so groundbreaking? Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. The countdown has begun for the first ever China International Import Expo. Shanghai is busy preparing to host nearly 3,000 companies from around the world. China is pulling out all the stops to champion free trade and globalization despite apparent U.S. efforts to put up more trade barriers. Take a look. The world's largest exporter trains its sights on importing. From November 5 to 10, 2,800 companies from over 130 countries are expected to be in Shanghai to showcase their products and to make deals with more than 160,000 Chinese and foreign purchasers. The China International Import Expo, announced by Chinese President Xi Jinping back in May 2017, is the first of its kind in China, a part of the country's efforts to open up more. Shanghai, which is used to hosting international events, has been holding rehearsals and training 5,000 volunteers as part of preparations. World industry leaders are expected to bring cutting-edge high-tech products with more than 100 new products and technologies expected to debut at the expo. New and upcoming companies look to win the hearts of Chinese consumers. While China rolls out the red carpet for the import expo, U.S. President Donald Trump is busy putting up more trade barriers. Under a new deal signed by the United States, Mexico and Canada, rules were tightened to limit suppliers for certain industries to be from the three North American countries. Parts of the deal were seen as a move by the U.S. to stop Canada and Mexico from signing a free trade deal with China. In the next five years, China is expected to import products and services worth more than 10 trillion U.S. dollars. Economists agree global trade has fueled growth over the past decades, and protectionism may just put a damper on that. For more on global trade, China's first ever import expo and the discussions related to the USMCA, join me in the Beijing studio. Zhang Gong, who is a professor from the University of International Business and Economics. Also in Beijing, Einar Tangen, our current affairs commentator. Welcome to both of you gentlemen. I want to start with you, Professor Gong. Your take on the USMCA. Some say, finally, there's a deal, you know, a substitute to NAFTA earlier. Others say, this is so different a version when it comes to trade deals. What do you say? Um, well, first of all, uh, I'm not very convinced that this is a much, much better deal than the previous NAFTA deal uh, from even from the American perspective. I mean, I think the significance of all that is that Donald Trump can claim he had a deal and he can claim that uh, this is a better deal. Mm -hmm. You know, the truth of it is, is not known, I mean, truth, at least not to the American people. Nobody's going to really go out and, 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 and really check what so is... So what are the details that you are looking at? Well, I, I, I think, you know, if you compare the, uh, the, 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 the clauses compare, uh, regarding the, the automobile industry, uh, the deals with Canada regarding the dairy product, maybe make some progress on the dairy products. It's, it's not a significant improvement, but I think from China's perspective, what's really significant, as we discussed in the, in the script, is, is respect to this Article 32.10, and that's a really, really significant development. Mm. And I think I'm really surprised, I don't know if you agree with me, that uh, Canada would acquiesce with something like this. Um, and it looks like uh, he's going to insist the same thing to be inserted in agreement with Japan. I think Japan is going to do that as okay. well. Okay, well, that's a comprehensive answer. We have to... <coughs> Divide some of those parts of the answer and handle them Later, individually. Okay. First okay. of all, what about that so-called car part and car component issue involved in the U.S. 
MCA, Mr. Tengen. Okay, it went from 62%, 75%. Well, it went from 62.5% to 75%, but if you actually look at the way that they're now defining it, it's only 70%. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about 7.5% difference. This is a far cry from what Donald Trump promised everybody. He's also said that the uh, 40 to 45% has to come from workers who are earning $16 or more a, a year. Now, that sounds great. Uh, it, it sounds great to yeah. American workers, but will it actually happen? The, there's a Mainly existing... Mainly it is the country of Mexico that that deal, yeah, yeah, that gonna, part is dealing with. Yes, but it's not that simple. I mean, there's a global supply chain that, to take down a factory and take it somewhere else to displace workers, to hire new workers, give Some them the employment. this could happen just within a few years' time. Oh, it, yes, it could happen in a few years if somebody is willing to make the investment. Remember, the, every, no one knows that this is actually going to pass. This has to be approved not only by the U.S., right. uh, Canada, and Mexico legislatures. It hasn't done that. And the clause that you're talking about, this idea that countries, sovereign countries, mm -hmm. have to disclose to the United States everything they're doing six months in advance of them doing it mm -hmm. and then show them everything. This is a very, very strange clause and it's right. going to be very difficult to pass in all these legislatures. Let's also talk about another part involved mm -hmm. in this deal which is about the dairy products. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly it seems that the, the American industry is open up a little bit the door to Canada Canada's when it comes right. to dairy products, but when you look at the numbers, certainly it's a very small number. Yeah. Having said that though, that could be politically significant for Mr. Trump, but the question is what has Canada sacrificed? Has Canada been compensated in the other parts of the deal? This is only understand well before we can see whether this deal would eventually become a deal. As you said, uh, the approval from the legislators coming from three countries has to be done next year. I'm going to jump in because I was former chairman of uh, Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin, National you know that. There we go. <laughs> yeah, the dairy I, I yeah, live right. in Wisconsin. Very passionate about the dairy well, industry. Well, no, I was chairman of the International Trade Council, which dealt with these issues. Actually, the <laughs> amount of market that's being owned is about $70 million. Now, unfortunately, that's not going to go to uh, farmers because what has happened is uh, basically fresh milk has a 500 mile radius which you can trade uh -huh. in and what has happened is the 70 million is going to be in after products these are products made by large corporations mm -hmm. spray powders uh, fractionate things like this which are going to compete in Canada. Canada has also gotten some givebacks. Now the American dairy market is now open to them. So they have some opportunity to do it. They also got some concessions on wood and also mm -hmm. on peanuts. Right. So it's not exactly the one-sided kind of thing that Donald Trump wants you to believe. Well, even though it's one-sided, that's good enough for the other two countries, right? You could say this is a relatively fair deal for all the countries no, involved. But you have to understand, if you go back and you look at TPP, you'll mm -hmm. see that they, they were going to get, the U.S. would have gotten a better deal under TPP. Remember, the, a lot of the NAFTA things were put on hold because TPP was going to be the successor to this. NAFTA was going to just melt away right. because it wasn't relevant. Okay, Professor Gong, dairy product. Well, I, I think for the, the dairy products, you know, Canadians uh, make some concessions, but as you said, it's a, it's a very small amount in the grand scheme of things. It's a few million dollars we're then talking about. Then that's good for the Canadians, it, one would argue. Uh, it's, it's good for the, uh, um, I think it's good for some, you know, dairy farmers in the state of Wisconsin, in the state of New York. Um, and um, I think uh, from Canadian's perspective, lumber is a big deal for, for Canada. Mm. Uh, you know, Canada and, and the United States been engaged in this lumber battle for years and decades going right. back. So now they at least uh, have some, uh, uh, some period of time that's secured for exports of uh, 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 lumber to the to, uh, United States. And, and on that aspect, I think uh, the Canadian definitely uh, gain something. Mm. Um, so, but, 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 but I think if you look at the overall picture, you know, I'm just, I think it's, a, it's, it's an improvement, but I'm, not, I'm just not sure that a, it's a gigantic improvement from America's perspective, as Donald Trump would like to claim. I mean, he like well, to claim I hope you're not standing just on the American perspective but also mm -hmm. looking at the other economies talking mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. U.S. President Donald Trump is trying to, as the media report suggested, rewriting free trade deals with Mexico, Canada, and the EU, Japan, and South Korea. These deals are expected to have clauses that will forbid similar pact with China. At next month's China International Import Expo, though, 2,800 companies have signed up and all G20 members represented as you can see over there. Having said that though, what about that clause? 
the clause in this USMCA that is forbidding the other two economies, certainly very big economies. One is the developed one, Canada, mm -hmm. and also dealing largely with China when mm. it comes to trade. And Mexico, a very impressive emerging economy mm. and developing country on its way up. So, Mr. Tangan, mm -hmm. when one country is signing a trade deal with the other country, but it is with the condition that the other countries cannot freely deal with economies outside this deal. That sounds very, at least, interesting, Mr. Tenge. Well, uh, no, Donald Trump is trying to establish an economic hegemony that is based around the United States. He's trying to supplant WTO uh, and all of the different trade pacts and basically say every country is going to deal bilaterally with the United States and we're going to use our power, political, economic, and military to guarantee that we get the best deal possible. Mm. We also have on the phone right now from Toronto, uh, Mr. Laura Brown, who is a professor of international relations and political science at the University of Toronto. Uh, Professor Brown, uh, what would you make of that deal, the clause that is dealing with Canada and Mexico forbidding the two countries to deal with China when it comes to more open trade? Why is Canada agreeing to that? Will that be an obstacle or a plus for Canada's economy? It uh, could be a problem. It's not directed specifically at China, but it is understood that it is more than likely to affect China. Canada was in a very difficult position in international negotiations. Uh, timing is essential. Linkages are important, and personalities are crucial. And so we reached an agreement, Canada, with the United States and with Mexico, when there was already a bilateral agreement in place between the United States and Mexico. So our choices were narrowed, and we were facing very harsh tariffs from the United States, and I think had we moved earlier, perhaps we would have got a better deal, but it is what it is at the moment, and we have this Article 32, which can present problems for the future, and there are indications that the United States, especially if they reach a deal with the Europeans mm -hmm. and with Japan and with Korea, We'll use this to pressure Beijing. Right. Well, the Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Trudeau, of course, was very ambitious at the very beginning and also very firm on principles, as he said many times. Of course, later, eventually, pragmatism uh, overruled everything else, and there is a deal, apparently. But the question is, Canada is running into election season next year. Uh, even the Prime Minister has to think about his own office. So how will this deal? Uh, the USMCA eventually mean for Canada when it comes to political elections and also whether this deal would actually ever approved by the legislation legislature well you're absolutely correct so let me start with the last part because the deal has to be approved in Congress and this is not guaranteed it's likely because there are so many important interests at stake but it is not inconceivable, depending on what happens in the November elections in the United States, mm. that there may be some difficulties in approving this deal. But if we, if we assume that this deal is approved by the uh, Congress in the United States, in Canada, as you know, we have a prime ministerial system. The government has a majority in Parliament, so there would be no difficulty in having it approved. But when it comes for uh, the next election, then it is both the substance and the perception of the deal. And there may be some issues with substance because some people will pay a price for that. Mm -hmm. uh, dairy farmers, for example, are pretty unhappy. Some of the resource extractors may have difficulty because we still have aluminum uh, and steel as well uh, that are at issue. But if uh, the perception in Canada is by the time the elections come around right. that Canada did not get the best possible deal. There will be undoubtedly a great deal of criticism and part of it will center on the problem of timing that Canada waited a bit too long mm. that we should have moved earlier we should not have fallen behind and faced a situation where we had Mexico and the United States move ahead bilaterally 
and I see. we had more limited room for maneuver. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Brown, of course, I understand very well that one would naturally look at its own neighborhood first before looking elsewhere in the world. This also applies to Canada when it comes to reaching this deal, USMCA. Uh, however, uh, one has to also point out economies like China and some of the others, which the clause in that deal actually could deal with for the future, are also having very strong trade ties uh, with Canada. For example, Canada will be also uh, very much represented at the incoming um, import expo, the first ever China is holding. Canada is one of those uh, host countries, uh, in fact. So uh, what would this mean for China-Canada trade, both the atmosphere and the content? It, it thinks a bit more tenuous, but we are very important trading partners, yes. By far the greatest trading partner for Canada is the United States, but mm. China is uh, an essential trading partner and in many ways a growing trading partner. And Mr. Trudeau has expressed the wish to try to diversify our, our trade because Canada is so very heavily dependent on trade with the United States. Over 60% of our exports go to United States. Uh, to the United States. Mm. We are a G7 country. We are a G20 country. We are an important player uh, internationally. And uh, when we come to linkages, then there are not just, uh, you know, the matters of trade, but also the political factors. The uh, relationship that we have in terms of the international politics right. uh, of the world, uh, the kind of uh, interest that we may have in various domestic and uh, international issues. Okay. Uh, we are interested uh, as a country to see uh, a resolution of the problem in uh, North Korea and China could help. All right. Professor Laura Brown, thank you so much. Coming from Canada, from Toronto, coming back to our discussion back in the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, one has to think about this. On the one hand, you see USMCA, it is, has been reached temporarily. We don't know its future, but you also see uh, new ideas p coming up and platform being established from the Chinese side as well, uh, coming from the import expo. But this is the first ever Professor Gong. Mm -hmm. So what is China having in mind? Is China trying to win more hearts and minds from the rest of the world vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, or is China having something else in mind? Well, the, the, uh, the Imports Expo is, uh, was planned a long time ago. It was planned <coughs> uh, and scheduled way before Donald Trump started the trade war. So I think uh, I, I want to interpret this expo as a uh, reaction to uh, right. Donald Trump's trade war. But I think uh, we uh, are very clear uh, about the idea that we have to do something in this area. You know, our huge uh, trade surplus with the United States in particular is not going to be sustainable in the long run, politic both politically and economically. So so it is something we already planned for. Uh, but I think uh, the trade war really highlights the importance of this event. I think it's a, uh, um, it, it could be a very strong signal to the rest of the world that China is uh, committed to further opening up mm. our market, uh, further uh, increasing imports in a very concrete way, actually, right. to, to, to help with uh, uh, alleviating uh, the uh, trade uh, surplus problems uh, with the United States. <coughs> when you look at the debate mm -hmm. about trade these days, mm -hmm. Mr. Tang, one might want to interestingly see at a critical moment where people would stand. Are they going to stand where the principles are or are they going to stand where pragmatism is? It is a very interesting time to test that about people's stands. Mm -hmm. Having said that though, what does it mean this time, the import expo? China is not trying to show, obviously, to any country about so-called attitude, mm -hmm. but rather this import expo has to benefit China's economy. After all, that's why people are doing things. They're doing things for their own economies and in a bigger context to benefit the rest of the world. So Mr. Tangan, uh, China has been accused of so many things. It is even hard to explain them one by one in one program. Mm. For example, latest, latest about so-called currency manipulator, which is mm. totally mm. out of context. Mm. Having said that, though, Mr. Tengen, what do you say this expo, import expo, is going to achieve content-wise? 
Oh, it's opening up new markets. I mean, it's a very good demonstration of what we, you know, what China has been saying that there's a win-win out there that is not a zero-sum game. Donald Trump is zero-sum playground bully tactics. I'm going to force you into a deal that makes sense for me, even if it doesn't make much sense for you. Mm -hmm. So you have a very, very stark contrast. And as you said, the question is, where does the rest of the world line up? Is it about pragma pragmatism or about principle? I think with Europe, you're going to see. And it's a common ground. If there is a common ground between the two of them, that would be even better. It, that would be nice, but I don't think <laughs> there is. Uh, I, I think when you have somebody like Donald Trump, who's made it his his business to make uh, all sorts of a uh, accusations unfounded, uh, and I don't, I don't mean just in his regular speech on a daily basis, but against not only China but almost every country on earth. All right. He has said they're bad guys. We're good guys. You should do this. You should do that. He has made America victim number one in the world. Kind of strange for the most powerful military, political, and economic society. But the Earth. thing is, Professor Gong, mm -hmm. will China be able to stand on a moral high ground? Will that work? I mean, this import export it's a wonderful thing because China is restructuring its economy. Mm -hmm. This is an, a step in the right direction. But on the other hand, this is also a time to see whether standing on the moral high ground is actually going to be ha having more peers come along, at least about the principles. Well, I, I have to be uh, very candid on this issue. Right. <laughs> I, I think um, <coughs> from a um, uh, free trade perspective, I, st I, st I still believe that there's still some room for China to, uh, to improve. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, I think it's not just about the numbers, the uh, alleviating the trade surpluses with many countries. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not just about that. I think uh, at the end of the day, there's still a discussion about you know, China as a, as a very unique economic model, uh, having uh, very unique practices, and you know, a bit quite successful uh, so far in terms of uh, developing an economy, uh, in terms of expanding uh, uh, corporate China's footprints around the world. But there's still this debate about whether you know, these practices um, are up to the, uh, I guess, the spirit of WTO. You know, and, and this is the, one of the major uh, accusations from the U.S. side. And I think these things can be put on the table for negotiation. Um, uh, for things like um, uh, we have a very uh, large uh, state sector, uh, the SOEs, for example. Um, we have um, you know, quite extensive uh, uh, state aid programs. Mm -hmm. And so these things um, are still quite up to debate. And, I, and so, so, so I think from the, from the moral um, high ground perspective, I'm a little bit hesitant to go that far. But mm. I think at least we have the, um, we have the commitment, we have the, um, the willingness to at least to achieve uh, th th these goals from a result uh, oriented perspective. You know, we really want to right. uh, uh, reduce trade uh, uh, surplus with other countries, no matter how we do it. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's really these numbers are counting. <coughs> The numbers are counting. The <coughs> principles are also very important as well. Uh, we, we, I think we need to uh, discuss ha with uh, our trading partners uh, to make sure that uh, they are comfortable with, uh, with right. these two practices. I mean, let me, let me finish. Uh, I think, to be honest, you know, it's, it's actually you know, even the European companies, uh, the European side, they still have some, even though they are not you know, ag they're against the sort of the tariff practices, okay. the, the tariff tactics from the United States. But I think from the, the substance point of view, I think to some degree, they're probably in, dis in agreement with Donald Trump on some right. of the issues. <coughs> we'll see how things would evolve <coughs> and whether attitudes are really reflecting the directions of the growth of the world economy. Well, I want to thank both of you for being with us, John Gong and Inner Tangent. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Stay with us here on World Insights. Still to come on the program.